If I can't say your not... last name, you gotta go. Yeah, they're just. Yeah, if I can't say your last name, man, it's, it's over, bro. You're now listening to the Wandering Buffalo podcast with your hosts Andrew Chang and Justin Goddard. Hello and welcome to the Wandering Buffalo Podcast, a show on the Built in Buffalo Network. My name is Andrew Chang and alongside me is my co-host Justin Goddard. Tonight, Justin and I are going to talk about our way too early roster prediction. However, for timing purposes, we're going to strictly just look at the offensive side of the football this week. Uh, Then we'll do the defensive side of the football on our next week's episode. As always, you can find us on our social media and podcasting platforms and even on YouTube by searching The Wandering Buffalo Podcast. You can also find uh, other amazing shows and content by looking up the Built in Buffalo Podcasting Network. They got great things going over there. And let's break down some Bills-related news, Justin. But first, how are you doing? I'm going to be honest. I'm, I'm pretty jazzed up right now. Um, oh, yeah? Yeah, I'm really excited about this episode. I had a lot of fun doing it. Um, this type of thing might not be for everybody, but I love roster construction. It's so intriguing to me and kind of putting on my GM hat for doing this exercise was kind of like with the, with the roster we have right now, like Mm -hmm. I am not envious of, of the front office and the decisions they have to make. Um, I'm a big fan of like the, the shows like hard knocks and, um, they had one on uh, Amazon Prime. Uh, the name is Oh yeah, with the Panthers. all or nothing. Yeah, yeah. yeah I yeah. love watching those shows and just seeing like the conversations they have to have is gut wrenching. Mm-hmm. And like just me writing down the names on paper was like, ah, that's gonna be a tough conversation. But I'm yeah. I'm really excited for the show. How are you doing tonight? I'm doing good. And going off of well, I guess echoing what you just said. Whenever I think of Hard Knocks, I just remember the intro, the one with the Cleveland Browns in the intro where Corey Coleman goes like, if you don't, if you guys don't want me, trade me. And then literally later that day, he gets traded to the Bills, and then he get, gets cut by the Bills. And I'm pretty sure he's on the Giants, maybe. I, I don't really know what's going on with him. But, yeah, I, I do not, I did not like making these roster cutting moves just because I found them really hard to be honest and there's a lot of good players on this team which is an amazing problem to have so it it was difficult for me and i i had to let go of some players that i really didn't want to agreed but anyways let's dive into some buffalo bills related news justin there was a fight and i'm not talking about mayweather and logan paul all right, I'm talking about John Feliciano and AJ Epinesa last Tuesday, apparently. It kind of seems strange, right? I guess it started because AJ picked off a pass for a touchdown. Uh, Feliciano didn't like it, which I guess led to a, a ball getting thrown at someone's head, punches thrown, yada, yada, yada. I just feels like in Bill's teams in the past, this is something I would expect in training camp or OTAs or stuff like that, but... You don't really see this with Sean McDermott-led teams, but things happen, right? Maybe maybe that Buffalo summer heat got to them. <laughs> Who knows? All in all, it, it just appears that there are no hard feelings between the two, and that's what John Feliciano stated, saying there's no animosity between them. So I guess it's all gravy. Yeah, this is, this is the type of thing that happens for me in the offseason. That's like it becomes news because – we people like us don't have much else to talk about right now um but this Mm -hmm. this kind of stuff happens at least one two three times a year in every training camp across the nfl you know Mm -hmm. kind of early in the process for when you usually see something like this happen but when you think about it and you're you're lining up against the same guys over and over again and you know oftentimes the offense knows what the defense is doing. The defense knows what the offense is doing. And it's kind of just getting those reps for both sides of the ball. Like, this is what you do when you see this look. And, you know, it kind of the defense will give a few different looks 
to kind of work through what the play is. Um, uh, so from from what I've heard and from what I've seen in the past, it's likely that AJ Epinesa kind of knew the play. For mm-hmm. me, whether you know the play or not, you still have to go out there and make the play. And oh yeah, for me, I like seeing that AJ Epinesa is working his tail off, and you know, he didn't intercept the ball and jog it out. He was like, if this was a game situation, I'm scoring a touchdown. Um, so mm-hmm. you know, maybe Feliciano just kind of went down there to say, "Young man, playing, stay in your place." Epinesa didn't like it, mm-hmm. but as long as there's no hard feelings and it doesn't bleed into bigger things in the locker room, I actually kind of like seeing some stuff like this, like. Right. If you're out there playing a game like this, you need the passion, you need the fire. You'd like to see it, you know, not turn into fists being thrown, but I like seeing the passion. Right. You know, football might be one of those, might be one of the only sports outside of boxing that you can literally punch your coworker in the face and it's okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, imagine if you could do that on a daily basis, like at our part time gig, just like, hey, I don't really like you right now. <laughs> I, you still have a job, but you have a black eye now. I probably have some black guys because I'd be picking the wrong fights. I'm a little guy. Oh, uh, you good, dude. <laughs> uh, I'll, I'll back you up. Um, moving forward, so Brandon Bean received the Jack Horgan Award, which is given out annually by the Pro Football Writers of America. Uh, the Associated Press described the award that it's given to a league or a club official for his or her qualities and professional style, style in helping the pro football writers do their job. So basically what I got from that is he's there to answer the press in a nice cordial way. Give straightforward answers and ample time to the press, which says a lot considering we're coming off a year where everything was conducted by Zoom and nothing was face-to-face, so... Brandon Bean obviously stood out from the rest of the NFL teams by being available, courteous, and there to answer all questions and give out as much information as the press needed. So I thought that was pretty cool. Yeah, I agree. It's pretty cool. It's it's one of the things that I do like about Brandon Bean as the general manager. You know, obviously around draft time, free agency, what have you. Um, there's a little bit more of keeping things close to the chest. Um, Mm -hmm. but like in his year on pressers and when he does talk to the media and everything, you're never really wondering where Brandon Bean stands on things. Um, you know what players he's expecting more from, what position groups he needs a little bit more from, you know, who his guys are. And, you, you know, we saw it at the end of last year, right? With the tight end room. He was like, yeah, they they were okay, but nobody was really scaring the defense enough that, you know, they were focusing a game plan around it. Um, yeah. So I, I like that as, you know, a fan, as somebody that's trying to cover the team. You know, there's so many years that we had just blasé answers and didn't really get much out of the front office. Um, so... You know, sitting down to listen to a Brandon Bean press conference, is it's a nice breath of fresh air for me. Yeah, a little bit of honesty really goes a long way. Yeah. It truly does. <laughs> Anyways, that pretty much wraps up the news update. Uh, oh, wait, the Zach Ertz thing. It, it kind of flared it up again. The Bills apparently reached out in the, like, fairly recently, if, if I'm not mistaken, right, Justin? Yeah, I mean... It's kind of worth talking about. I know it's kind of across the platforms getting beaten to death. Uh, I mm-hmm. mean, as far as I'm concerned, if they bring in Ertz, for me it has to be like that. A third round pick? No. No, <laughs> no, no, no. No, no I, I, think, I think Howie Roseman probably somewhere in the early part of the process kind of got like a fourth round pick offer. Mm-hmm. And probably scoffed at it, and now it's kind of like there's not much of a market. So, for me, it's, it's more like of a contract a fifth, thing. Sixth or something like yeah, that. Yeah, I'll give you a fifth or a sixth if we can work out a contract. Um, but I also think that kind of if you're bringing in Ertz, especially if you can't rework the deal, you're pushing Dawson Knox down the depth chart because you don't bring him in to be you know your number two, number three, whatever. Yeah. 
And I, I kind of want to see if this can be the breakout year for Dawson Knox. It's a very important year for him. Right. And very important. If he can take the next step, I think we can have a very valuable playmaker in that position. Not that Ertz couldn't be, um, mm-hmm. but Dawson Knox's physical gifts are, you know, tops in, tops in the league for the position. And I just kind of don't, I'd rather see him blossom than hinder the growth by bringing in a Band-Aid. Right. Um, just as far as I'm concerned. I don't know your thoughts on that. You pretty much hit the nail on the head there. If he's coming in, it's got to be for the right price. And if he does come in, we got to work out that contract. And you also have to understand there's repercussions to Dawson Knox development. Right. It could be good. It could be bad. We just don't know. So. Right. I don't. I, I'm not gonna. I don't feel comfortable speaking upon it because I just don't know what what would happen if he did come in. You know. Fair enough. Yeah. Anyways, let's move on to the main part of tonight's episode, which is the 53 man <laughs> roster prediction, specifically focusing in on the offense. And according to ESPN, which is where I got the 83 players that the Bills currently have on their team. There's a decent amount of people on this team. There's 83 of them. So I had to cut down 30 players, and this was hard to do. And I can't exaggerate this any more than I already have at the beginning of this podcast and in the past. But I'm glad Brandon Mean gets paid to do this, and I and I don't. Because I would, I would take forever to do this. Because it took me literally what felt like eons to do it. And I would encourage you as a listener to do this exercise as it really shows how deep of a roster the Bills truly have, and it's just kind of fun, right? So if you want to do it, let me know, and I'll send you my Excel sheet, and we could we could all talk about it, and Justin and I would love to have that. Did you find this to be difficult, Justin? Yeah, I. this was the most challenging episode that I've set out to, you know, take my notes on and all that. Um, mm-hmm. It's just... For me, like with this roster where it's gotten to, I'm writing down names of guys that you go back two, three years, and I was like, we need to see more of this guy. This guy needs to be highlighted. You know, I love this player's development. We need more of him. And now I'm like, you're on the fringe, man. And like, am I keeping you because of how I felt three years ago, or is it like actually the smart decision? Yeah. So. It's- I do want to throw a little PSA out there. This is a friendly reminder that. We do pride ourselves on being average Joes. So this kind of roster projection for me, I might not be 100% spot on on, like, you know, Mm -hmm. what kind of cap implications are out there. I know there's some guys, some of the bigger names that, you know, you can't just get rid of because dead money and all that. But this Mm -hmm. is kind of like with what we have now. In a perfect world. Yeah, with what we have now, what I would cut it down to in my ideal world, I guess. Yeah, if the world was in a vacuum. Right. I get you. Well, that being said, we're going to break down the offensive side of the football, and I kept 25 players. So let's start with quarterbacks. For me, I kept the following quarterbacks, Mitchell Trubisky and Josh Allen. So that means I have the Bills cutting Jake Fromm and Davis Webb. You know, Davis Webb here, no surprise. He's just most likely gone just like he is every year. Maybe he'll be on the practice squad, but I don't think so because if Jake Fromm gets cut, he's probably going to be the new Davis Webb running the practice squad team, a role that should suit him pretty well considering it it would, it would should be similar to the COVID quarterback role that he played. And outside of that, I mean, they have to get cut because Mitchell Trubisky is going to be the ultimate backup quarterback. Right, and... I'm not too far off from you there. I, I have the same cuts being made. Um, I I assume Fromm ends up on the practice squad. Mm-hmm. Um, for this exercise, I didn't go too far into, you know, who's going to the practice squad and whatnot because as it mm-hmm. stands right now, we don't even know if it's going to be the same rules as last year. As of right now, they're saying still 16 players for the practice squad. Mm-hmm. Um, but before the COVID year, it was 12, so... I didn't want to go that far down the rabbit hole. I think we'll probably revisit this as we get kind of closer and see some camp battles working out. The only real difference I had from you is for Davis Webb, 
cut that man and offer him a coaching contract. It, it's how it's what I felt we should have done with Matt Barkley. Um, they're basically just around around in the room to hold a clipboard and kind of talk to Josh about what he's seeing anyways. From everything I understand about Davis Webb, you know, mm-hmm. he's a great locker room guy. He was organizing team workouts and all, he was doing all the little intangible things. So just make him an assistant quarterback coach. Let him let him there's no salary cap on that. Let him do that. I'm good with that. Yeah, that's what people are saying about DA, but that never happened. He went back to golf. So yeah. <laughs> we'll see we'll see what happens with Davis Webb. Hey, he might even make the team. Maybe. <laughs> Maybe. All right, let's go on to uh, the running backs here. So I have the Bills keeping all of them. Devin Singletary, Zach Moss, Matt Breida, and Taiwan Jones. Uh, I mean, I have them cutting, what, what's his name? Oh, God. His name is escaping me right now. Antonio pop- Williams or Christian yeah, I Wade? Yeah, have, I, have, I have them cutting those two players. But, I mean, C- Christian Wade's still learning the game. I know it's been three years, but... You still have to learn the game, blocking, catching, and it's a switch from rugby. It really is. And if it was that easy, players would literally transition from rugby rugby to the NFL all the time in no time. It just doesn't happen. Antonio Williams, yeah, I I think people might have a little of recency bias. He came in at the tail, like the second half of a. 17th week game where the other team just kind of gave up in my opinion he looked nice though he did look nice he looked nice though i remember my friend who's not even a bills fan was like if i'm the bills i'm definitely starting this guy over anyone else i'm just like well that's why you don't watch football like yeah you, you just yeah okay. he he looked nice and in, in some second half action on a game that was already out of yeah. hand and if the bills truly felt like that he would have been active moving forward, but he, he right. wasn't. And he didn't get called up. He's a he was a guy that last year I that think. was on on the practice squad, off the practice squad, on back forth, yeah. back forth. It was like uh, in the in the office. Yeah. Snip, snap, snip, snap. Right. <laughs> Takes and a I toll have no, on a man. Right. And I don't have qualms against the man. I just don't think he's I just don't think he's gonna make the team. Yeah, so um so I had the same four as you. Um mm-hmm. Singletary, Moss, Brita, Taiwan Jones. Um, I think Antonio Williams is a, another practice squad candidate. Mm-hmm. I, I do like what we have in him there, but not enough to be um, supplanting any of those four. Mm-hmm. Um, for me personally, this is this is a cut where I kind of went more predictive than than my feelings. Mm-hmm. Um, so Taiwan Jones for me. I love what he brings to the team on special teams. Uh, I always, I always think he'll forever be immortalized in my brain. That the time he lost his helmet and he was like bleeding from his forehead, like still Oof. trying to make a play. Like I Trust love that about right. the guy. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's he's good. And with the with the emphasis this regime likes to place on special teams, is why I kept him uh, for a roster spot. Um, but when you start looking at the nitty gritty of it and how talented this roster is, I think it's going to end up to it's going to end up being you know somebody else I don't want to go and I'd honestly rather try to replace a special teams ace um, than some of this some of this really deep talent we have in other positions. But for for right now, he's on the team. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, just to touch on those four running backs that we had making the team, I, I just think the Bills view Singletary and Moss as the two main guys, and Breed is obviously a great change of pace, quite literally, and can almost be the T.J. Yeldon role moving forward, except I think he'll actually be able to be on the active game day roster as he can contribute in many more ways than T.J. Yeldon. So I, I just think that's what's going to happen. And, of course, it, to your point, again, Taiwan Jones is a special teams ace. I don't think he's going anywhere. They love him. Moving on to the wide receivers, I have the Bills keeping six wide receivers. Six. That being, oh, them being Stefan Diggs, Gabriel Davis, Emmanuel Sanders, Cole Beasley, Isaiah Hodgins, 
and Marquez Stevenson. You so did it. I ha- you did it to our boy. I, I did do it. So I, I have, and our and when when we're talking about our boy, we're obviously talking about Tanner D- Gentry here. He's a He's monster. Got, yeah. <laughs> no, he, he Tanner Gentry's got to go. He he just has ties to Josh Allen. That's pretty much it. And there's no reason to have him on here. Duke Williams, I think, you know, Duke Williams has been the, on the outside looking in since being signed him in the first place. You know. He popped off in that Titans game when we elevated him and then had some burn here and there. Josh threw him a, uh, a decent amount of passes in that Houston playoff game, and then we never really saw Duke again. Right? Right. Jake Kumro, practice squad maybe, just like last year. Touchdown, oh, hey, Jesus. Hear me out. Maybe we can trade him to the Packers to appease Rodgers. Maybe get a little something uh, Maybe like a in third turn, round pick. You know? Yeah, yeah. yeah the just... Packers definitely need Jay Kumro. Hit, right. hit up, hit up my boy Bean, Lance Lenore. Yeah, no, no. I'm good on that. I'm no all fumbles. the way out on him. No fumbles. Brandon uh, Powell. Powell. I was actually kind of iffy about this one. I was like, do we keep him? I don't know. He's fast, from what I hear, and he's going to offer a lot for the return position. Which is valuable, but we have other players that can do that and can contribute to the team in other ways. So for that reason, I just scratch Brandon Powell. And of course, Isaiah McKenzie. This is a hard choice for me, but I think the Bills really like McKenzie. But we can't ignore, well at least I can't ignore, how long he hung out there in free agency. He signed for peanuts. He even said, like, I would, if they paid me in candy, I would sign sign here. And I think Marquez Stevenson is a faster, more explosive version of McKenzie. And if he can learn to return punts successfully, or at least hold them without fumbling, then in my opinion, it's it's a no-brainer. He's got to, as long as Stevenson has a little bit of returnability in him, I, I just think he's the better choice. Any cheaper. So Barely the, cheaper, I guess. The, this is this is one of the spots where I was talking before about guys like two, three years ago that we just couldn't wait to see more of, you know. A little mm-hmm. bit with Christian Wade, you know, he had that just awesome preseason. And then a guy like Duke Williams where it was like we were so devoid of talent that you know we see these guys start flashing in preseason we're like yep we're the ones that found the the cfl gem and the guy from england and these guys are about to take that's just the spot we were in like looking Mm -hmm. at these dudes thinking they're about to take over the league we're in just such a better shape now roster wise that we don't have to we're not looking at stuff like that we're looking at you know your top four or five spots are roster locks and, mm-hmm. you know, you're talking Gabe Davis, uh, even Isaiah McKenzie. We haven't really seen I, uh, Isaiah Hodgins much yet. But you're talking these dudes could be, like, wide receiver 2-3 on other teams, and we're talking about them as, like, the fourth, fifth, sixth guys. Mm-hmm. Um, so for me with this position, I pretty much keep everything the same. And I'm going to be the first to admit that I'm – Probably wrong here just historically. Um, mm-hmm. The three years that Bean and McDermott have been together, it's always been six wide receivers. I have them keeping McKenzie. Um, uh, initially, I, I was going back and forth between McKenzie and Stevenson, um, kind of under the assumption that they ride with the, the proven what they know they have in McKenzie for a year and then mm-hmm. letting Stevenson emerge into that role Uh, i did some roster finagling that for this year we were able to keep both of them um you have insurance policies ready to go all the time if if any of your top like four go down and kind of be able to make a seamless transition um this was very much you know brandon bean sean mcdermott wanting to keep the fastball and just kind of investing a little bit more in this position than they usually do based on how much we like to pass and and how much that makes our offense dynamic. Right, right. And 
I just want to touch base on who we kept real quick, right? So Stefan Diggs, mm-hmm. he's not getting cut, right? He, he literally led the league in receptions and yards. He's here. Emmanuel Sanders, very very good route runner. We've been trying to get him a whole get him in the building for years now. We got him. He, he's he's a lock. Cole Beasley, unguardable. In, in perpetuity, I want Cole Beasley forever. Yeah, he's unguardable. So like. He's he's a lock. Gabriel Davis, great rookie year. Big expectations for his sophomore year, and again, he's on a rookie contract, so really big deal. Great value. He's a lock, in my opinion. Marquez Stevenson, I had him on the team for the aforementioned reasons, but I also think the team really likes him, and he's a draft pick. He is a draft pick. Six round draft pick, and you know, just because you're a draft pick doesn't mean you're going to make the team, but it it does help, you know. And I picked Isaiah Hodgins to make the team because I correct me if I'm wrong here, Justin, but there were a lot of waves getting uh, about Isaiah Hodgins last year in training camp, but then that shoulder injury kind of side, you know, put him put him on the sideline, and he was on IR and then they just sort of like all right uh we we got a good thing going here let's just IR you for the whole year we'll shut you down next year next year and I think when we were doing when you and I were talking about draft like last year that some people had Hodgins ranked higher than Davis is that correct yeah there there was a lot of scouting people that I follow that um had Hodgins rated a lot higher than Gabe Davis going into the draft um, you know, that's just kind of draft projections. People are right and wrong all the time, especially when you get into mm-hmm. fourth, fifth, sixth rounds. But for me, it's it's the same front office scouting the same players. And if that many people liked Hodgins and that many people liked Gabe Davis and we got both of them, um, I'm really excited to see what Hodgins ends up bringing to the table. Um, for me... For me, if if they do stay at six receivers, I think McKenzie's the odd man out. Um, I just, I personally wasn't ready to say goodbye. Uh, yeah. I love how gritty he is for just, I mean, he's like, what, 175 pounds soaking wet. He gives the little guys a fighting chance. Yeah, I understand. All right, well, we're going to take a quick break, and we'll be right back. Welcome back, everyone. We're going to finish up the offensive 53-man roster breakdown, and we're going to pick things right up with the tight ends. So, I have the Bills keeping the following tight ends. Dawson Knox, Jacob Hollister, and Tommy Sweeney. So, I have them cutting Nate Becker and Reggie Gilliam. So, you know, you just gave me a look, and we, we can talk about this after, Justin, but... I have them cutting Nate Becker. You know, he's just been a practice squad dude for quite some time, and I don't think he's going to get some burn. I I just don't foresee any change like that happening anytime soon. And with Reggie Gilliam, I think, I'm not sure, but I think that Reggie Gilliam wouldn't have made the team last year if Sweeney didn't have that, you know, heart infection because of COVID, you know? That being said, if Sweeney comes back and is 100% healthy, I think he's going to take over that tight end three role. I liked what he did in some of those preseason games. Now, again, those, those are preseason. It's 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 preseason, but I, I think the Bills know they have more with Tommy Sweeney. We just haven't seen it. The, the way you were saying preseason there, I thought you were about to do the talking about practice yeah i know well that's kind of what i was going for <laughs> we're talking about here preseason um pre-season. So, so you broke my heart with reggie gilliam um oh. and so reggie gilliam's on the team for me uh, i okay. think i think he offers a lot in in special teams um he kind of developed a little bit nicely you know just a little role player in the offense um, mm-hmm. I also have uh, Dawson Knox and Jacob Hollister. For me, 
I liked what Tommy Sweeney looked like in his first year with us, uh, especially being a seventh round draft pick. Um, but with the room, I know it's something that you like to talk about a lot and having the variance. And for me, Tommy Sweeney is kind of just another player at tight end. What I like about Reggie Gilliam is he kind of gives you that that fullback, special teams, a little bit of tight end. He's a little bit of, of a Swiss Army knife there. Um, Reggie Gilliam somebody that I will just die on the hill for after hearing his whole story of how you know his pro days got canceled so he went over to walmart got all his own filming equipment sent his tape to everybody like that that commitment to getting to an uh, nfl club for me is just it's something you don't see stories like that every day so Mm -hmm. whether or not he measures up whether or not he ends up making the roster if he's talented enough i know that whenever that guy slaps on his pads, you're getting his 100%. Oh, and, yeah. And I really, not to say that any of these other guys aren't doing that. Um, I just, and I love that guy. I love his story. Yeah, I, I don't know. Like, with Reggie Gilliam, I really like that story. I almost forget about that, how hard he went in to do that. Ah. <sighs> See now you're making me feel bad about doing it, but I, we're having conversations I, I, here. Hey, I mean, hey. if I'm making you feel bad about that, I'm I'm cutting the guy that had to sit out last year due to heart complications. So who's the real monster here? Both of us. Yeah, both of us. This isn't a fun exercise anymore. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's uh, move on to the offensive tackles. So I have the Bills keeping the following offensive tackles. Deion Dawkins, Tommy Doyle, Daryl Williams, Spencer Brown, and that's it. I bet you thought I was going to say someone else, too, weren't you? <laughs> yeah. Uh, no, I, I have them cutting Bobby Hart and uh, Cyrus Tutelli. Yeah, it's just... If I can't say your like, last name, you got to go. Yeah, they're just... <laughs> Yeah, if I can't say your last name, man, it's, it's over, bro. <laughs> no, no, it's just you know Bobby Hart. He he's not getting burned. Let's be for real. He he's he's got experience in the league, sure, but it doesn't really say much about him performing at a really high level. It's like average to below average play, and then Cyrus is a undrafted free agent, right? So. For the similar reasons to Bobby Hart, I just don't think he's going to make the team. Right, and Bobby Hart, uh, so I feel like this was kind of like some of the off. Bobby Hart was like one of the off-season moves that was kind of like Bean's moves of where can we share up depth and be able to have camp bodies and make our decisions. You know, you go out and you add two tackles in the draft, all of a sudden Bobby Hart, you know, maybe he would have gotten some burn at some point. Mm-hmm. Um, but when you add in those two players, I just, I don't, I don't see that as likely. Yeah. Um, so I'm just taking a look here to make sure I'm on the same page. I did all of the offensive line as one group and I do have, I have the same, the same four stay in there. Um, okay. I lumped uh forest lamp in with the tackles. Um, and also Ryan Bates. Uh, Ryan Bates has that the versatility they love. Um, mm-hmm. I had Ryan Bates getting cut. I could really see that one going either way. The organization seems to love him because you he can play out. What's that? You got Ryan Bates getting cut? Yeah. I, I To me, that one was kind of like a personal one for me. It's like that we love him because he can play all five positions. It's like you got oh. Reggie Gilliam making the team. Hell yeah, Ryan Bates ain't. Hell yeah. Oh, I, it to me the I like the position flexibility argument and all that. Mm-hmm. Give me a guy that plays one or two positions maybe, but does it really well versus like a guy that's maybe a passable starter at all five. I I, I just. I don't need my offensive lineman to be able to play all five. Give me, like, 
a guard tackle combo or like a guard center combo. If you're trying to play mm-hmm. all five, it's it's just too much. All right. Well, let me let me tell let me talk about the interior offensive line that I kept. I have John Feliciano, Mitch Morris, Cody Ford, Ryan Bates, Jamil Douglas, and Forrest Lamb. So I have the Bills cutting Jordan Devy, Steven Gonzalez, Jack Anderson, and Ike Bakker. So with Jordan Devy, shouldn't be a surprise. He's he, he's just not making the team. Steven Gonzalez, super late, super, super, super late free agency signing. And he didn't really catch on in Arizona, to my understanding. So, I mean, that offensive line... I think I I personally think it's like worse than the Bills. So if he's not catching on there, how he he's just not catching on with us, in in my opinion. Ike Bakker, I know, I know. But I think Bakker benefited from the injuries on the interior offensive line last year. Plus, by bringing in Jamil Douglas and Forrest Lamp, it makes it that much harder for him to make the team. And it's really. It, it's hard, right? Like, those two just have way more starting starting experience and are most likely better than him. I mean, you can't forget that Bakker did hang out there in, you know, free agency, basically, because he was a, what, RFA and all that stuff happened. So we just don't know what's going to happen with him. Well, for a while, we didn't know what was going to happen with him. So I, I just don't think he's going to make the team. But if he does, you know, I'm not going to be upset about it. Really, I'm not. And Jack Anderson. I think he's practice squad. I think he had a tough time at the Senior Bowl trying to show off his flexibility, trying to be a center. It just didn't really work out that well. I I, I just don't know. Like this this one was a hard one for me to cut just because I know he's a draft pick, but that doesn't again that doesn't mean you're you're safe. And especially he's a seventh round pick, so that's where I'm coming from. Yeah, I. So the the one I have here that's different. I I have Ike Butker staying. I I thought he played really well last year. Um, sure, he got his chances due to injuries and whatever. But for if we're talking about a depth piece, we're talking about a backup player. You know, in an ideal world, he never touches the field. But based on what we saw last year, if he is forced into action, I know what I'm getting from him, and it's a passable starter. Um, Jack Anderson I I also see as being a practice squad guy. I think maybe next year, following year, as, you know, some of the players' contracts are coming up and and whatnot and we need some cheaper labor, um, you see him get elevated, have some more time in the system. Mm-hmm. Um, Jordan Devy, I also have on the outs. I thought you said made the team. I was like, what? Like, <laughs> no, he he's another one with he's another one with Ryan Bates for me though. That like, if I saw the final fifty three and he was there, I wouldn't be that surprised. They they kept him around at almost every week last year. He was a per, uh, protected practice squad player, so mm-hmm. like they liked him enough that they weren't letting any other team sniff around him. So, I I haven't seen much of Jordan Devy myself. So, mm-hmm. I have him out. But based on what they see every day, maybe there maybe there's enough that they like there. All right. Um, Jamil Douglas, Stephen Gonzalez. Sorry, sorry, friends. I had I had them going, and Forrest Lamp. I pretty much am keeping for for the pedigree. Um. Mm-hmm just based on where he was drafted and kind of being a reclamation project. Um, maybe with our coaching staff, we can kind of get that, that untapped potential and, and really unlock a hidden gem there. Draft and develop, but this time sign and develop. Yeah. Okay. We've done that before. Yeah. So I just want to talk about the Ryan Bates thing real quick. I think the team loves Ryan Bates. And I love how we sent what what Eli Harold to the Eagles for him. Yeah, it, 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 that was a gold swap by Bean, and 
I think it's so nice to be able to put someone in at any position and know that, like, okay, he's not the greatest at it, but we know there's a backup to the backup in case something crazy happens and crazy things happen. You know, people have to shift over and you got to make do with what you can. So for those kind of not ideal situations, that's why I think the Bills like having Orion Bates in their back pocket. And the team does speak highly of him, so we we have a disagreement here, Justin. And um, that's okay. That's okay. I mean, the, the scenario you're, you're breaking down there is basically Mitch Morris goes down. Wouldn't be that surprising. He missed time last year. Feliciano yeah. goes down. Wouldn't be that surprising. He missed time last year, and now you need mm-hmm. a center. Um, for me, that that's more where you have Jack Anderson on the practice squad, and you can call him up. Um, he he's been working in training camps on, you know, playing a little bit of center, and maybe you can develop the versatility there. And and I'm. As I kind of just touched on, I'm more interested in like a two position versatility where it's like, you know, guard center or guard tackle versus just the nuance of learning all of your assignments. And, Mm -hmm. you know, Ryan Bates is going into practice every day and he has to learn every position on the line. You know, how long have we been talking about like the the Cody Ford thing just kind of being handcuffed by am I playing tackle or am I playing guard like it's hard enough mm-hmm. for him to be learning two positions okay let alone fair. having Ryan Bates learning the full spectrum of tackle to tackle it's it's just it's too much for me to to ask from somebody that's a bottom of the depth chart kind of guy I'm sorry Ryan I didn't want to do it that is that is a very good point and yeah, I, I definitely see where you're coming from. So, I mean, I'll just leave it at that. We can still disagree. It's okay. Yeah. Anything else you want to say about the offensive, you know, 53 roster prediction? Uh, not not much. I, I kind of was able to – I was happy with how my offense turned out. Um, Me too. I, I also had my little tidbit in here of maybe we can throw a trade out for Jake Kumaro and see what the Packers say. <laughs> um, I'm glad that you and I were in agreement on that. Yeah, I just so I think kind of where we stand now, um, a good majority of these kind of cuts are kind of obvious and straightforward. Obviously, when you when you get into the rotation pieces uh, across the offensive line and stuff like that, it, mm. it's a little bit more complicated. Other than that, right. it's kind of ticky tacky right now. But like as as we said at the top of the show. This is a way too early roster prediction. You know, we have the Ertz thing sitting out there. You know, we don't know if we're going to make a move for another CB2. There's still so much time where where so much can happen in the league and bring people in and all the little tail end of the roster stuff Bean likes to constantly be doing. At this point, we're not even working with the, with the full right set of players, right? Right, right. I agree with it. And again... That's why it's a way too early 53-man roster prediction, offensive edition. But I think that's going to wrap it up for this week's episode. As I mentioned before, next week we're going to do the defensive side of the 53-man roster prediction and special teams, of course. But as always, go ahead, like, comment, subscribe, and review our podcast, as well as other amazing shows that you can find on the Built in Buffalo Network We're always looking for guests on the show, so please reach out to us on social media platforms if you're interested by searching The Wandering Buffalo Podcast. Justin, tell us where we can find you. You can always find me on social medias at jgods22. And uh, just before we sign off tonight, I just just want to throw something in here um, to Andrew and Jake. I've I've just been having such a blast doing this with you guys. Um, Thanks, man. I just... Every time we get ready to do this, I'm I'm so psyched to be working with you guys on this. To Built in Buffalo for bringing us in, giving us a chance. Thank you. Everybody, make sure you're checking out their shows. Mm -hmm. And for all the fans listening, just thank you for sharing our excitement, our passion, all that. 
Um, any feedback you want to give us, any comments, any questions you want to throw at us for us to talk about on the show, set us up. We're, we're doing it for you. So appreciate you listening so far and look forward to making shows for you in the future. Damn, Justin. I went off well script on said. you. Well said. I, I don't even have anything to say to that. I mean, I could just echo the same thing, but that's just not original. Just go Bills. Go Bills. Till next time, my friend.